So here we are. We've known each other for almost 40 years, and you were already kind of a legend in terms of your engagement with all of the stuff that we love. Uh, history, preservation, architecture, art, museums. Did you, how did you get started? You were in Concord, New Haven, and what calls someone to the work of architecture, preservation, and the civic affairs? How did you come into all this? Well, I think the first association I had with architecture and place, my father was very uh, attracted to handsome real estate and became very successful in Boston, working for George Marsh Company, and um, proceeded to buy more interesting properties. And so when I was about 10 years old, we moved into a really very handsome 1910 Colonial Revival house that had been built um, on the outskirts of Concord. And uh, so there were a series of maybe five or six properties, um, both in Concord and in New Haven. Those properties obviously made an impression on me. And so I'm aware that from being really a, a kid, um, there was a hierarchy of significance. There was an issue of integrity. And there were lots of stories related to not only objects, but the people who had the objects made or the people who bought the objects a hundred years ago. Um, before I entered uh, college, I had already decided I wanted to be an architect. Okay. And in Concord, um, there were uh, really two presences. Well, um, one of them was an older gent named Andrew Hepburn, uh, who was the senior partner at uh, Shepley Bullfinch. And he was the architect of Colonial Williamsburg. And in his retirement, he would um, occasionally do a, a slideshow. And I remember in the early 50s going with my mother to hear Andy Hepburn talk about how Williamsburg was recreated from English engravings of the 18th century. That's great. And then there was a cousin of, a brother, of my brother-in-law um, named Russell Cattell, and he was a master at Middlesex School, which was next door to where we lived. I did not know that. And he lived across the street. And of course, he was a great mover and shaker in what is now the Concord Museum, which was then the Concord Antiquarian Society. And so I remember going around the Antiquarian, the Concord Antiquarian Society with Russell Cattell, talking about all these things that you and I went to visit. At, in those days, um, there was a four-year Yale College BA. And then the architecture school had a four-year graduate program, which was a Bachelor of Architecture degree. If you were going to do both, um, as a freshman, you identified that that was your interest. Um, you could, in fact, do three years of Yale College and immediately go into the architecture program in lieu of a senior year. You were required to go into um, Joseph Albers' design class, which was for architects, for artists, um, and art historians. And you played with all the colors and uh, material objects, et cetera, et cetera. And Albers was a huge intellect and influence on the teaching, um, and he was head of the design department at Yale at the time. I started in the autumn of 1956, wow, okay. and I got out in 63. July of 63. Yes, Yale Architecture School was definitely uh, the cutting edge of modernism, and the chairman of the architecture school changed in 1957, and it became Paul Rudolph, who was from Florida, and he was running his office, uh, his architecture pra practice, um, parallel to his position as chairman of the architecture department. That attracted um, to Rudolph and the Yale School a whole series of international architects who were invited to come well, for a semester. Okay. Louis Kahn was a frequent uh, member of the architecture program at Yale was very 
Beaux-Arts, let's say, until the early 1950s when George Howe, the Philadelphia architect, became the dean. And he brought in um, all of the kind of uh, Bauhaus thoughts that were gestating until um, Rudolph came as the chairman of the architecture department. Um, and then it really blossomed um, under Rudolph. And that was exactly the period that I was in New Haven. I worked for him during vacations. When he had prominent guests as architect, he would say, well, now, Jared, you take these people on a tour of New Haven architecture. So I had a whole routine and could drive up and down the streets of New Haven and talk about the buildings and their period. Um, before I became a, a freshman, that summer, uh, the summer of 56, um, I was working as a summer intern in an office of an architect based in New Haven who happened to just be the chairman of the American Institute of Architects and was the chief architect of the restoration of the White House. Douglas Orr's office was and his three partners. And um, one day the, the front conference room was busy um, outside where I was and um, somebody came in and said, oh Jared, we need you. So I was told immediately to go uh, down to the end of Hill House Avenue to, um, to look at Joseph Sheffield's house, which was Ithiel Town's house, and that um, had been increased in large, doubled or more um, by Henry Austin. And Yale, the two men in the office asking me to do this were Douglas Orr and um, Aero Saarinen who was commissioned to do the master plan for Yale um, architecture, I mean, for the development of the campus. And, and so I was sent off to assess whether or not the Sheffield Mansion could be taken apart and reinstalled at the top of Hill House Avenue, where the famous Hill House residence called Sachem Wood was located, that being an A.J. Davis and Ithiel Town design building the Yale uh, architecture history uh, offices where Vincent Scully and Scully was working on something and so I engaged him in conversation about what, how would we go about the Sheffield Mansion being moved and the other character was also a professor of architectural history at Yale, um, a man named Carol Meeks. Um, Meeks actually uh, started Haven Preservation Trust and his first, the first project that they organized around was the intended demolition of another Henry Austin house um, on Hill House Avenue uh, called Professor Dana's house. And the Dana house was threatened by demolition by the university and Carol Meeks and a number of Yale faculty who lived in New Haven objected strongly to this and as a result, the university actually backed down. So this, about 1957 or so, was the, part, the point where y y Yale woke up to the importance of Hill House Avenue? Well, yes, and, and academically, you see, Scully would do a, a fall introduction to architecture, American architecture, and his fall lecture was uh, the, the, the three graces. There was Le Corbusier, there was Frank Lloyd Wright, and there was Mies van der Rohe. So by the time you were drenched in Vince Scully's wonderful poetic presentations, um, and everybody was wowed, uh, the winter and spring term, a class on 19th century New Haven architecture mm. done by Carol Mee. Uh, I was asked in oh. 1972 and he asked me if I would be willing to be an adjunct uh, instructor and do a course on Hartford 19th century architecture. So I wrote, I wrote 12 lectures, oh, wow. and they were all illustrated, and I took the photos and borrowed images and stuff like that. The Mark Twain House to do uh, architecture tours in Hartford. And the Wadsworth Athenaeum had... Um, previously had some architecture tours done 
um, asked me if I would mind doing just bus tours of 19th century architecture in Hartford. How did you meet Claire Cooley? Is that what brought you to Hartford or was it something else? No, I came to Hartford because I was looking for a job after, um, when I finished um, architecture school in 1963, I got a job in Milan, in Italy. It was a great year and a half, I have to tell you. I have spent my whole life in New England, and to be so removed, um, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Decided, well, gee, Hartford is an up-and-coming place, and so came up to Hartford. And then I worked for uh, Ebbets, well, it was Ebbets, Frid, and Prentice, but then Frid, Ferguson, Mahaffey, and Perry it became and I worked for them for 12 years, and then stepped out of that and started the firm with Tyler. And Claire came into the picture because when I came to Hartford um, in 1965, Claire was a student year abroad living in Vienna, and she was transferring to NYU. Uh, Claire's brother and I were in the same class at school. Um, the Cooleys were very generous and invited me to come to spend a night in Hartford. And at that point, Claire was about 10. So fast forward back to uh, her NYU uh, experience. Did a spent a summer um, at the uh, uh, Institute at NYU, their art history center um, in the old Duke House there on Fifth Avenue. She eventually en enrolled to get her master's degree there. Anyway, so we decided to get married the next year. So in Hartford, uh, I, there were a number of um, associations that I was asked to make. Um, one of them was to uh, chair something called the Fine Arts Commission for the city. And that was because I was a trustee of the Athenaeum and in about 73. At that time, there was a house threatened for demolition at the south end of Prospect Avenue. At our lunch, Tyler said, well, gee, why, didn't you set, why hasn't anybody set up a preservation organization in Hartford? And so we were talking about this, and I said, well, God, I said, Hartford has torn down some of its most important buildings. I mean, God, what are we going to do? And Tyler said to me, well, if we don't do something, we're going to lose a lot more buildings. And so by the end of lunch, I said, well, yeah, so let's start a preservation organization. And we looked at each other, and I said, well, I could be chairman of a board of you know, trustees of, of this organization. And Tyler said, well, I'll be the director. So we walked out of the restaurant at the Athenaeum, and that was our, our plan. Well, it actually started in 71 with that conversation. But, and the threatened demolition of uh, the Loomis Woolley House, as it was called, um, the one on Prospect Avenue. We're also anxious about the fact that this wonderful George Keller designed YMCA was threatened for demolition. And they tried, we tried as a group to persuade the directors of the YMCA not to tear it down, but we lost that battle. Decided that it was better to put up a struggle for a, and, and lose the battle, uh, and in the process gain a lot of publicity and build a membership. So we started off with a bang, and we produced a, a terrific organization. The financial support came uh, literally from the members, the members. And the first newsletter came out, uh, rather uh, done in the back room, um, and it had a series of articles in it. And one of the articles was about the threat to demolish the YMCA. That was planted just to make sure people understood uh, what the situation was. A second article, uh, was a little bit uh, cheeky, but that was um, reporting that the trustees of the Colt Bequest were, dis were considering the demolition of the Church of Good Shepherd. And they were very distressed that this was even brought out in public. And um, 
I suffered actually <laughs> because of that. I won't. And uh, you and Claire have been so interwoven with the well-being of this city, and I, I know there are lots of personalities over the years that you've known in the with the politics uh, going on in City Hall. The head of the city, uh, which was the city council, uh, really, not the mayor, um, had an agenda for uh, improvements in the city of Hartford. It was Nick Carbone, Nick Carbone and a couple of the other council members, and um, they were very opposed to the Fine Arts Commission's charter, which in fact stipulated that the commission had to review projects uh, that were intended for the city. And they didn't like the uh, idea that anything other than the city council, even though we were asked to do it as a commission appointed to do it, um, we were eager to do it, we did it, um, but somehow the powers that be w really were opposed to a commission. Well, you would have had a good relationship with George Athens. Yeah, he was a character. Yeah. And uh, I remember when um, Sandy Calder presented his little maquette for the Stegosaurus um, to the board of the Athenaeum because it was on Athenaeum property. Um, Burr McManus Mall was built on. Um, so Calder's maquette was presented to the um, trustees of the Athenaeum and um, George Athens and his mayor um, decided that he would come to the meeting. Um, <laughs> we thought it was very nice that he had shown up and he was very courteous and all that stuff. But the next day he launched a kind of anti-stegosaurus um, moment when I think he got dressed up in um, in armor and said that he was going to play St. George to the sculpture. And it, it was in the paper and uh, I thought well I don't think he was being mischievous, I think he was just actually having fun. And I always thought that was a, in his favor that he had decided that he could joke about it. Well, I mean, of course, the Stonefield sculpture, Carl Andre, uh, was famously controversial in that it cost a lot of money and most people didn't, don't understand how that's art. I, I was chairman of the Fine Arts Commission when the Stonefield sculptures were on the table to be discussed, and of course it was highly um, politicized because they were a bunch of rocks and anybody could go and put the rocks in a line and, or several lines and call it sculpture. And so that was, a, that was very controversial. And it, what was interesting is that it was, a, it was built, if I remember, with $50,000 that had been donated by the Hartford Foundation. Uh, and it was in, maybe it was in commemoration of the fact that the foundation was a celebrating its 50th year something to that effect. And uh, there was a very serious effort of selecting sculptors for memorials, and there were several schemes uh, before Andre was selected. Um, I would assume that the Athenaeum probably had some role in it. A couple of years ago, we went to Dia Beacon in New York State, uh, and they had probably the biggest retrospective on Carl Andre there has ever been. So I got a, you know, <laughs> ten thousand square feet of Carl Andre art. It happens. There's nothing much to it, and in a way, it's so much more forward-thinking environmentally, realistic, but it's Great. very elegant, and it'll stay there a long time. I hope. It is that it's much harder to preserve things people don't care about. So part of my sense of purpose here has been to get people to care about the stuff that's right underfoot. Sometimes when I raise the subject of tourism, which is, you know, is Hartford ever going to be Nantucket? Of course not. Uh, but could, w would it be helpful to the city if we had 50% more visitation in a year? Well, how could it not? And so that sense of 
valuing the culture, the history, and putting it to use, connecting it with a rising tide of public engagement, is something you've done. Um, but one of the factors today is that people who are in leadership positions in Hartford are not from Hartford. They're from somewhere else. And their time in Hartford is perhaps limited to their time working in a company that's based in Hartford. And um, I think it was maybe even 25 years ago um, at an event in which she was seated at a table that was not the head table. And there was a very important um, a businessman sitting at the table fuming because he wasn't at a table with more important people. <laughs> and Claire engaged him in some conversation and I, <laughs> I think it went something to the like, um, well, I really don't give a damn about Hartford. I mean, I've just come here four or five years ago and I'm only going to be here another four or five years. And as soon as we're finished with Hartford, I'm going to get out of here. That And it was the most <laughs> shocking thing to poor Claire. And um, she often repeats that story. But um, that's often the problem because of these corporations now um, bringing people in to fill executive positions who have no connection whatever to the city. Um, and the city for hundreds of years had basically been led by citizens of Hartford. The sort of uh, local uh, leadership in these corporations existed 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and no longer, because the companies have been bought up by larger companies elsewhere. And so the executive, the front offices have moved away. Yeah. I had actually, in my application to win a tour, uh, they had a question that said, where do you want to be in five years? In five years, I'd like to be organizing an exhibit about some aspect of the material culture of the Connecticut Valley. Because I'm and happy. you live to believe it. And I, it's been unbelievably rewarding in many ways. It, to me, it's a bottomless pit of a reservoir of incredibly interesting things to learn, discover, to cherish, to present, to interpret, to educate people with. and. I, I wish there were d dozens of people like you that all feel the same way. Well, I know one of the questions you asked um, earlier had to do with the cult uh, connection. Um, was saying how she had all this, these things from her great aunt's house. And she ended up with a whole lot of of the household effects uh, of arms bear for all of Mrs. Colt's correspondence, um, which is now at the Beinecke Library. I mean, it is Elizabeth Colt's correspondence to her family about all of her trials and tribulations. Uh, the, Elizabeth Colt is one of the great, great, great stories Hartford has to tell, and I think Frederick Law Olmsted next year is his 200th anniversary, and obviously Mark Twain and 